Good afternoon. My name is Nobuko Kashiwagi, and I would like to welcome you to the 2022 Arwin Forum. The forum is an initiative of the Japan Center for International Exchange, JCIE, and the Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia area, conducted under the auspices of the Government of Japan's Asia Health and Wellbeing Initiative, or ARWIN. Today's event is a hybrid meeting. So in addition to those of you who are joining us today in person, we have many others watching on Zoom. For those in the room, please turn your headsets to channel two for, for English and channel one for Japanese. For those on Zoom, please use the globe button at the bottom of the screen to select your preferred language. We have an exciting lineup of speakers and panels, but to ensure that we have time for questions from the audience during our panel sessions, I'd like to ask the speakers to please be mindful of the time. Now, let us begin. To start the meeting, I'd like to introduce Mr. Akio Okada, the president and CEO of JCIE, one of Japan's leading foreign policy institutes and one of the organizers of today's events. Mr. Okada will speak in Japanese, so for interpretation, please use the headsets, or for those joining online, please click on the globe. Mr. Okada, please. ご紹介をいただきました日本国際交流センターの大河原でございます、えー、本日あご離席の皆様、えー、多くの皆さんのご参加を得て、えー、東アジア ASEAN アア経済研究センターエリアとの共催でこのフォーラムを開催できますこと大変光栄に存じますお忙しい中皆さんご出席いただきまして誠にありがとうございます私ども日本国際交流センター JCIE は1970年に設立された国際関係に携わる民間財団でございます。創立以来50年余り、その時々の世界と日本が直面する諸課題について、政策対話の場を設けることをその重要な役割として多くの事業を展開してまいりました。本日のテーマでございます、国際、高齢化、問題に関しましては、国際保険、グローバルヘルスという大きな枠組みの中で、官民協力、さらには国境を越えた協力のカタリストとなるべく、様々な活動を実施してまいりました。日本政府が2016年にアジア健康構想、アーウィンを発表されました。私どもセンターはその動きに貢献する形で、エリアの皆様とのパートナーシップのもとで、アジアの高齢社会対策に関する国際対話や、情報発信を推進してきた次第でございます。アジアでは皆さんはよくご存知のように、えー、急速なスピードで人口の高齢化が進んでおります。特に日本は世界で最も高齢化が進んだ国であり、日本が辿ってきた経験は他のアジア諸国の皆様に多くの教訓をご提示できるものと考えております。また、同時に様々な課題を抱えております日本ですが、他のアジア諸国から学ぶことも多々あるのではないかと考えている次第であります。本日のプログラムはご案内を差し上げました通り二部構成となっております。長時間になりますがよろしくお願いいたします。第一部では特別挨拶、基本、基調講演に引き続きまして、二つのパネルディスカッションを予定しております。高齢化問題はとかくその負の側面から語られることが多いのですが、実は長寿は素晴らしいことであり、そこには様々な機会があると考えております、えー。テクノロジーもその一つでございまして、本日のテーマ、フォーラムでは、健康な長寿社会を築くために、ハイテク、ローテク、合わせてテクノロジーの力をいかに活用しうるか、様々な分野の専門家の皆さんを交えて議論していく予定にしております。そして第2部ではアジア健康長寿イノベーション賞の授賞式を行う予定にしております。この賞は2020年に開始いたしまして、英語の頭文字を取ってハッピー賞と称しておりますが、この間のコロナ禍にもかかわらず、おかげさまで今回で3回目を迎えることができました。本年は厳正なる審査の結果を踏まえまして、中国対日本の8団体が選ばれました。誠におめでとうございます。本日、皆様に会場においでいただきまして、後ほどの授賞式で、それぞれのご活動を広くご紹介できることを大変嬉しく思っております
、今回のアーウィンフォーラムにご出席いただきました皆様、えー、ご登壇をいただきます皆様、そして特に海外からお越しいただきました皆様に、改めまして感謝を申し上げます。最後になりましたが、フォーラムの開催にご講演をいただきました内閣官房健康医療戦略室、厚生労働省、沖縄科学技術大学院大学、オイスト財団の皆様に心より感謝を申し上げ、簡単ではございますが、開会の挨拶とさせていただきます。本日はよろしくお願いいたします。ありがとうございました。Next, it is my pleasure to introduce one of Japan's top leaders in the global health field, the Honorable Keizo Takemi. Professor Takemi is a senior member of parliament in Japan's House of Councillors and is a senior fellow at JCIE. Professor Takemi, please. Tada ima go show kai ni azukarimashita, Sangyen Gin no Takemi Keizo de gozaimas. Nisen nen no Millennium Summit. そして G8 の沖縄感染症イニシアチブその頃からこのグローバルヘルスに関わるようになりもう20年以上が過ぎてまいりました2015年に SDGs が採択されその中でユニバーサルヘルスカバレージがそのターゲットの一つになりましたその後我が国としてこのアジアでこのユニバーサルヘルスカバレージを実行しようとするときにどういう考え方でこのアジアにおけるユニバーサルヘルスカバレージに貢献できるかこれを考えたときのアジアの諸状況というものはまさに人口の高齢化でありましたしかも欧州と違ってアジアにおける人口の高齢化のスピードが極めて速くしかも経済が十分に成長し一人当たりの国民所得が十分に高くなる前に高齢者人口が増えていってしまうこうした状況の中で日本は突出したアジアにおける高齢社会として多くの経験を持ちそれをまたどのようにアジアの国々に還元することができるかこれを考えるようになりアジア健康構想というものをこの考え方を基軸として提案をさせていただきましたそして大変ありがたいことに当時の安倍総理がそれをしっかりと政府の政策として採択をしてくださいまして以後一貫して我が国はこのアジア健康構想というものを官民が連携して行う形になってきているわけでございますでこのアジアにおけるこの先進的な高齢社会という視点に立ちますと明らかにシンガポールがございますでシンガポールにおきましては今日このセミナーに基調報告をするためにわざわざお越しくださいましたジョン・ウォン教授がいらっしゃいますジョン・ウォン教授はこの分野におけるまさにリーディングな研究者でありシンガポール政府の中のさまざまなこうしたプロジェクトに参画をされてそして実際に国際的にもこの分野で指導的な役割を果たしておられる先生であります今回そのジョン・ウォン教授がこのセミナーに出席をして基調報告をしてくださるというのは私にとっては大変光栄なことでございますそしてさらに世界の医学医療公衆衛生分野において最高峰の学術機関の一つに米国ワシントンの全米医学アカデミーという組織がございますでこのアカデミーナショナルアカデミー・オブ・メディスンといいますけれどもこのアカデミーは高齢化社会に対応する国際的な取り組みとして健康長寿のためのグローバル・ロードマップというイニシアチブを立ち上げてておりまして私はこのイニシアチブの国際統括委員会の副議長を務めさせていただいておりますでこのイニシアチブは今年6月にレポートを発表しましたで高齢化がもたらすリスク課題および機会を分析検証した上で
提言をまとめておりますこの全米医学アカデミーの国際委員の一人でもあるジョン・ウォン教授は本提言をまとめるにあたり中心的な役割も果たされておられます本日はそのレポートの提言をのアジアにおける意義を基調講演で発表してくださるということでございますので私も非常に楽しみにしておりますで本日のフォーラムの最後にはアジア健康長寿イノベーション賞の受賞式が執り行われますこの賞はアジア地域内の健康長寿社会構築に向けて効果的で革新的な活動を発掘し表彰することで地域内でその知見を学び合いアジア全体への普及を促していく促していく目的のもと2020年に創設をされました直後に新型コロナの感染拡大によって応募者の皆様におかれましては大変なご苦労を強いられたことと思いますがそれにもかかわらずこの3年間で国内外から200件を超える多くの応募をいただきました。無事3回目を迎え念願,念願でございました海外の受賞者の皆様を日本に招待することができ、本省の国際選考委員会の委員長としても大変嬉しく思っております。受賞者の皆様、また本日会場にいらっしゃる高齢者ケアに関わる多くの方々が新型コロナの渦中で、これまで以上に高齢者の健康や暮らしを考え、新たなイノベーションを生み出してくださっていることに心から敬意を表したいと思います。本日の会合が皆様にとって実りある時間となること、またアジアの高齢化課題の課題に向けた着実な一歩となることを願い、挨拶とさせていただきます。ご清聴ありがとうございました。Thank you very much, Professor Takemi. Next, we welcome Ambassador Hiroshi Minami to the stage. Ambassador Minami is Deputy Director General of the Office of Healthcare Policy in Japan's Cabinet Secretariat, which is the agency that oversees Arwin. At the same time, he serves as the Ambassador for Global Health in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan. Among his other past posts, he was the Chief Negotiator for the SDG negotiations. Ambassador Minami, please. ただいまご紹介に預かりました内閣官房健康医療戦略室の南でございます。よろしくお願いいたします。本日はこのアーウィンフォーラム2022にお招きいただき感謝申し上げます。このフォーラムは2019年にその第1回にが開催されて以降、新型コロナの影響により3年間開催され,開催されておりませんでしたが、ここに第2回が開催されることにお喜び申し上げます。日本政府は2016年にアジア健康構想を発表し、健康医療戦略の重要な柱と位置づけてまいりました。この構想の根本には、日本として健康長寿社会形成を迎え、そのための産業育成を行い、国際展開を図っていくべきであるということが問題意識としてございました。日本のみならず、多くのアジア諸国は、現在人口の高齢化への道のりを急速にたどりつつあります。長寿ということはそれ自体が必ずしも素晴らしいことではありません。健康に生きられるという前提が大事であって、健康寿命をどのように伸ばすかということが重要であります。日本政府はアジア健康構想のもと、このような共通課題を抱えるアジア諸国と協力すべく、覚書を結ぶこととし、現在6カ国と締結しているところです。今後、日本政府としては、アジア健康構想に従って、各国との協力関係を強化していく考えでございます。この3年間、国際社会は、新型コロナのパンデミックへの対応に追われてまいりました。新型コロナによる被害は、スペイン風邪以降、かつてなかったものでありましょう。しかしながらいくつか明るい材料もあるのではないでしょうか。短期間でワクチンが開発され、アクトアクセラレーター、コバックスといった国際協力の枠組みができたことが一つ挙げられます。また、デジタル技術、革新的技術が保健医療分野で大幅に実用化されたということも挙げられるでしょう。デジタル技術、革新的技術が保健医療分野に活用されていくことは、医療サービスへのアクセスの拡大、より先進的な医療診断の向上など、いろいろな効用が期待されるところです
。本日はまさにそのような議論が聞けるのではないかと期待しております。<笑>この3年間、国際的な往来が制限され、国際会議も中止されるか、あるいはオンライン会議で開催されることが極めて多かったものと思います。確かにオンライン会議による開催については、一応の目的を達することはできるものと思います。しかし、私は国際会議の意義は公式な会議上での議論だけではなくて、非公式な意見交換、廊下であるとか、レセプションであるとか、そういうところでの非公式な会話にもあるものと思っております。このような非公式な意見交換、会話はオンラインでは達成できないのではないかと思っております。今回皆様が3年ぶりにこのように一堂に会して議論できるということは非常に喜ばしいことと考えております。今日の会議の成果が大変実りあるものになることを記念いたしまして、私の挨拶をさせていただきます。ご清聴ありがとうございました。Thank you very much, Ambassador Minami. Our next speaker is a world renowned expert on healthy aging and age friendly communities. Ms. Alana Officer, head of the World Health Organization's Demographic Change and Healthy Aging Unit. Although she is unable to join us in person today, Ms. Officer has kindly sent her comments to us via video. Can we have the video, please? Hello. It's an absolute pleasure to be able to join the Asia Health and Wellbeing Initiative Conference that's focusing on the power of technology for healthy aging in Asia. Today's societies were just not designed to support older people's health and wellbeing. And as a result, we spend an increasing number of years in, in, in ill health after the age of 60. To improve the health and well being of current and future generations of older people, the United Nations declared 2021 to 2030 the UN Decade of Healthy Aging. In consultation with states and non state actors, it was decided that four action areas needed to be prioritized. We needed to tackle ageism. We needed to deliver integrated care. We need to provide long term care to people who need it. And we need to ensure that our communities are much more age friendly. Today, I want to take a few examples to illustrate why the themes of today's conference are essential to the implementation of the decade. The first action area is ageism. A the theme of this conference is on, proving, on improving data. Reliable and valid measures on ageism don't exist. We're working to develop these tools and are really open to collaboration. We know that to enable everyone to better understand and monitor prevalence of ageism, understand its determinants, understand the impacts of it, and whether our interventions are working, we need to have those valid and reliable tools. The second and third action areas of the decade are around integrated care and long term care. And WHO advocates for ensuring that health care and social care are effectively integrated to enable people to continue to do what they value, but to also to age with dignity and to ensure support to their caregivers. A theme of this conference is harnessing innovative technologies. And the opportunities related to both integrated care and long term care are, are vast. For example, predicting and responding to falls, use of technology to motivate people to be physically active, technologies that can support people to remain cognitively engaged and reduce、uh, impairment, or digital interventions to reduce social isolation and loneliness. But we know that improving health and well being for older people requires actions that go far beyond our, the health and social care sectors. We need actions in education, in labour, in transportation, in housing, in information and communication technology. And that's why the last decade action area is about building communities that are better places in which to grow older. Now, today I know that you're going to be discussing how to design. Age friendly cities to facilitate mobility and social inclusion. 
And in thinking about that and achieving those outcomes, we need to be recognizing the really wide range of capacities and the resources that exist among older people. We need to anticipate and respond flexibly to the needs and to the preferences of older people. And we need to respect older people's decisions and their lifestyles. And at the same time, ensuring that we leave nobody behind and our actions help reduce inequities in older age. WHO advocates for uh, creating age-friendly cities and communities on the basis of improving transportation, housing, health and social care, uh, information and communication, as well as uh, urban planning and civic and social participation. And WHO supports a global network for age-friendly cities and communities, which covers more than 1,400 cities in over 50 countries um, that are trying to make their places better places in which to grow older. If more communities work to become more age-friendly, many more older people will be able to retain their health and autonomy and continue to be included and contribute to their communities. It is important for all of us to remember that the future is not somewhere where we're going, but somewhere that we get to create. By working together, we can improve the lives of both current and future generations of older people. I wish you a very successful conference. Thank you very much. We are very grateful to receive this message. Next, I would like to ask Professor Zhang Wong to take the stage for our keynote speech. Dr. Wong is the Isabel Chang Professor in Medical Sciences and Senior Vice President for Health Innovation and Translation at the National University of Singapore. A medical oncologist, hematologist by training, Dr. Wong has most recently been serving as the co-chair of the U.S. National Academy of Medicine's Commission for a Global Roadmap for Healthy Longevity. Dr. Wong, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, Okiwara -san Sensei, uh, the Honorable Takemi Sensei, uh, uh, the Hon uh, Ambassador Minami Sensei, uh, thank you very much for this great honor for uh, coming and spending this time with you. Next. Uh, firstly, let me congratulate uh, uh, Awin on actually being established because I think that Japan has so much that it can share with the world. Uh, and the whole world can learn so much from Japan in a, in a fundamental change that is happening, and that is demographic change. Next. And the fact that, uh, next please. The fact that the Forum 2022 is really looking at key areas of harnessing technology, how do we look at data translation and innovations, and how do we co-design age-friendly cities are very important areas to focus on. Next. So why aren't we celebrating? Uh, longevity must be one of the greatest miracles of the last 100 years. Next. And I think one reason why we're not celebrating is because of the concerns about demographic change. So we just heard uh, a Dr. Lana officer uh, share that the UN is making this decade, the decade of healthy aging, because in 2020 was when the curves crossed. There are now more people in the world over 60 than under the age of five. Because not only has longevity been the great miracle, but we've seen this tremendous fall in global fertility rate by about 50% or more across all populations. Next slide. And as Takemi Sensei mentioned, um, unlike climate change, which is affecting all of us more or less at the same time, the speed of demographic change is very different. So it took 115 years for France to move from an aging society to an aged society. The United States took 72 years. Most of Asia is going to experience this in 23 years. So this is happening so fast that unless countries in Asia really understand what is about to face us, 
in, in the next 20 or 30 years, things are going to be quite precarious. Next. So the US National Academy of Medicine convened a commission, which uh, Takemi Sensei shared. And one of the first things that was noted is that this rate of aging, this, the rate of aging is going to fundamentally impact the way we live, learn, work, and play. Next. It's going to affect family structures and relationships, social infrastructure, social insurance and retirement programs, housing, transportation, and public space, chronic disease, healthcare delivery and financing, and the workforce size and composition. Next. So the question is, are we prepared? And the answer is, there is it's unclear that we are prepared. There's very mixed levels of preparedness globally. Next. Very few countries are prepared to both meet the needs and equally important, seize the opportunities of longer lives. Next. And no country excels in all the domains. Few countries score well on all the dimensions of aging preparedness. Next. So we have to prepare financially, socially, and scientifically for this gift that we've been given, longer lifespans. It's a global imperative. Next. So as the Kemi Sensei mentioned, um, in June of this year, this report was released. It is free. Please download it. Uh, it's about 220 pages, but it's well worth reading. Next. An international oversight board was convened. Uh, Takemi Sensei was the co-chair. Uh, Victor Zhao was the, uh, the other co-chair, along, along with Joanne Jenkins. They are commissioners. They are oversight board members from all around the world, including Asia. Next. And I was privileged to co-chair this commission with uh, Professor Linda Fried, Dean of the School of Public Health at Columbia University. Uh, Professor Hiroki Nakatani from Keio University was from Japan, and China was represented by Professor Yao Hui Zhao. Next. So I want to start off by saying that we have found evidence, strong evidence, that supports the potential for health span to equal lifespan, that you can be healthy throughout your life or very much close to your whole life. Next. Now, what if we don't do anything? Well, if we don't do anything, there are going to be more people living with poor health, suffering and dependence. Next. We're going to have GDP that is lower. That could be if we didn't have better health and full inclusion of older people because they are the growing resource in our countries. We're going to have increased fiscal burdens on government. We're going to have increased financial burdens on individuals and families. We're going to have loss of contribution from older people to the well-being of society. We're going to have lost opportunities for people of all ages. Next. So all 17 goals of the UN Sustainable Development Goals are critical for this to happen. Next. But I want to call out Sustainable Goal 9, where the importance of, because of this Awin 2022, the importance of infrastructure and innovation. And I want to call out uh, um, uh, Sustainable Goal 11, uh, the importance of sustainable cities and communities. Next. So the National Academy of Medicine defined healthy longevity as the state in which years in good health approach the biological lifespan with physical, cognitive, and social functioning, enabling well-being across the population. And the foundation, the foundation of all of this is preservation of health for all into older ages. Next. So what does this mean for individuals? It means that if we are able to take the evidence, 
we can have long lives with health and function well into our old age, oldest age. Next. It means that if we are able to meet all our aging associated needs, we can live long lives of dignity. Next. It means that healthy older people have the full opportunity to engage in meaningful and productive activities that meet their goals, where they can bring their social capital to contribute to society, strengthen intergenerational well being and cohesion, and leave a better future. It also means that loneliness and isolation are not the default experience of aging. Next. It also means that young adults have greater inter intergenerational support and more job opportunities. Next. And very importantly, adults of all ages are valued. Next. What does this mean for societies? It means that long health span and decreased health disparities are assets for nations and societies. It means that there are intrinsic assets and goals of older people that are valued. And if we enable this, it allows the whole of society to benefit in both monetary and non-monetary roles. It means that younger people can be more successful because there are going to be more jobs and less dissatisfaction. It means a bigger workforce, a stronger economy, and an increased ability to invest in human capital and public goods. It means enhanced social capital with strengthened pro-social goals. And it means when older people thrive, everyone thrives. Next. And equity, intergenerational cohesion, and decreased precarity within and between countries. Next. Now, why is this so difficult? It's so difficult because health is the outcome of a complex system. Next. We identified four domains, the longevity dividend of work and retirement, volunteering, and lifelong education and, and uh, retraining, social infrastructure, the importance of pro-social strengths of older people, addressing ageism and age discrimination, social inclusion, financial security and retirement, and digital literacy. The physical environment, the importance of housing, public spaces and infrastructure, safety, transportation, digital technologies, addressing climate change and environmental need hazards. And health systems, the importance of addressing chronic conditions, public health, healthcare delivery, long-term care, the healthcare workforce, and geroscience, technology, and big data. Next. And just looking at housing, you can see the interrelationships between housing and everything else. And that is why it is so difficult, because it's a complex issue, and it requires a whole of society, whole of government interventions. Next. So healthy longevity, or the lack of healthy longevity, is the result of interactions of complex systems. Next. Multiple systems within society will need to be activated, transformed, and coordinated. Next. Now, innovation in any one sector will not lead to a transformation towards achieving healthy longevity. Because healthy longevity is about all aspects of life. It requires an all of society and life course approach involving transformation in every sector of a nation. Next. These are all the relevant actors. And you can see that this involves the whole of society and the whole of government. Next. And this is probably the most important diagram I would like to show you. Because if we invest in the enablers, if we invest in work, social infrastructure, the physical environment, and health systems, we then lead to growing productive and robust societies, and this in turn will generate human capital, social capital, and ultimately economic capital. What is stopping us? All those factors in red. Next. So how to begin? Well, we think that we need to invest in complex systems, addressing all the factors that I mentioned, 
and we made recommendations for the next five years. Next. So there are five principles. The first principle is that people of all ages, particularly older people, must reach their full potential to live life with good health, good function, meaning, purpose, and dignity. Next. And societies must enable the best health and function that individuals at all ages are capable of attaining. Next. Societies must reduce disparities and enhance equity within and among countries to realize the well-being and contributions of all people, including those of older ages. Next. The human, financial, and social capital of older people must be realized for the benefit of all society. And the fifth principle, we must use data and meaningful metrics to track the achievement of outcomes and guide decision-making. Next, there are going to be eight goals, economic and social benefits generated by people living, working, volunteering, and engaging longer. Next, social infrastructure, institutions, and business systems must enable safe and meaningful work and other community engagement in every stage of life. Next. Education and training opportunities that promote participation in lifelong learning and growth. Next. Social cohesion augmented by intergenerational connections and the creation of opportunities for purposeful engagement by older people at the family, community, and societal levels. Social protections and financial security that mitigate the effects of financial vulnerability at older ages. The physical environment and infrastructure that supports functioning and engagement for people at old ages. An integrated public health, social service, person-centered health care, and long-term care systems designed to extend years of good health and support the diverse needs of older people. And the last goal, quality long-term care systems to ensure that people receive the care in the setting that they desire for a life of meaning and dignity. Next. So there are nine recommendations. The first recommendation that governments in collaboration with the business sector should design work environments and develop policies that enable and encourage older workers, older people to remain in the workforce longer. Next that we need to develop and redesign education systems to support lifelong learning. We need to look at the science of learning and training. Next. We need to reduce ageism. Next. We need to build financial security for older people. We need to improve financial security by increasing financial literacy and mechanisms for promoting pension contributions self-funded pensions, and lifelong savings. We need to develop user-centered and cohesion-enabling intergenerational communities. We need to invest in public health. Next. We need to shift healthcare systems to focus on healthy longevity. And we need to look at long-term care and develop strategies to honor where the where people want their long-term care. Next. Now, of particular interest to Arwin, I want to focus on the last, on three recommendations. Firstly, enabling intergenerational communities, and this must be user-centered and cohesion-enabling at the city level. Next. At the neighborhood level, at the home level. We need to make broadband accessible, and very importantly, we have to address the digital divide because too many older people do not how, need, know how to use information technology. And we need to design public transportation to address first mile and last mile needs. It's no point having public transportation if people can't get to it. Next. We need to look at investments in public health. We, we are spending a lot in healthcare delivery and not in public health. Next. We need to invest more in prevention and wellness. And we need to set ourselves five-year targets and use data to tell us whether we are meeting those targets. 
And so finally, we need to shift healthcare systems to focus on healthy longevity. Healthcare systems need to be affordable, accessible, and culturally appropriate. They must be person-centered and they have to be integrated. We need to align the payment and reimbursement with healthy longevity outcomes. We need to look at outcomes that patients want. So what are patients' goals? What are their preference? And how do patients tell us whether we are meeting those targets? We need to look at investing in our healthcare providers to make sure that the providers themselves have the training in how to look after older populations. Next. And then we need to strengthen our geriatric workforce. There are not enough specialists trained in geriatrics. Next. And finally, we need to empower our citizens with data and how they can manage their own health and give them the tools. So what are the dividends? Well, the returns of investment is that health is an asset. It's a priceless asset. If COVID taught us nothing, is that without health, we cannot have anything else. Next. The economic returns on healthy longevity will be reaped into oldest ages. Older workers, if they are healthy, can increase the labor supply, and if they are healthy, will have fewer accidents. In many sectors, consumers value the service by older workers. Next. We can create more jobs for young adults. This is the same thing happened when women entered the workforce. The economies grew. If we keep older people in the workforce, economies can grow. There's the potential for mentorship also by older people. There's very good studies to show that intergenerational teams are more productive and innovative. Next. Longer work lives mean less burden on pensions and social security. Next. Volunteering and caregiving by healthy older adults contributes significantly to GDP when that value is monetized. And very importantly, we create new human and social capital, next, which themselves would lead to economic capital and increase GDP from the above. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Wong. We now welcome our first panel to the stage. This panel will be addressing the issue of translating data and innovation to policy and practice. And we hope to have some time for questions from the audience at the end. Our speakers for this panel represent different fields and perspectives on the topic from business, academia, and international organizations. Dr. Hiroyuki Fujita and Professor Prasert Asantachai. Our third panelist, Mr. Ashish Narayan is listening in and will join us via video conference for his presentation and the discussion. Moderating our session today will be Dr. Tengu Aizan Hamid, Professor in Gerontology and Social Policy at the University Putra Malaysia and Research Fellow at the Malaysian Research Institute on Aging. She is also a member of the International Advisory Committee for the Healthy Aging Prize for Asian Innovation. Professor and speakers, please join us on stage. Professor Tengu Eisenhamid, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for the kind introduction. And my name is Tengu Eisenhamid. And I will be moderating the forum in translating data and information for policy and practice. This, the session aims to address the question of how to develop and harness innovative technologies to improve the lives of older persons. This session is, is co-sponsored by the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology Foundation, one of Asia's leading graduate research institutions. 
Population aging is a mega trend that have touched many countries in the world. Nonetheless, developing countries are experiencing aging at a much faster speed with much less resources to address emerging consequences of population aging. At the same time, technological development is advancing at a rapid speed. Within this rapidly changing environment and population aging, developing countries are at the crossroad of facing challenges and new opportunities to address population aging and addressing economic growth and development at the same time. Research is key in developing evidence and policy based uh, policy, evidence based policy. Nevertheless, there are gaps in research related to aging and technology. There are also gaps in translation, translating research into policy and practice. Barriers to dissemination and translation can be categorized as characteristics of the research intervention itself, the research design and situation of the intended targeting settings, and the interaction of between the three categories. In addition, there may be limited policy initiative or ecosystem to encourage innovation, which may, which may result in underinvestment in innovation and the capacities to innovate. In this forum, the panelists will share their thoughts and experiences in translating research into policy and practice. This forum is conducted face-to-face -face and online, and each panelist is given seven, seven to 10 minutes to introduce their topics areas. After each presentation, there will be question and answer session and the panelists are free to respond and expand the ideas of put forth by the speakers. For online participants, you can participate by writing your questions in the, the Q&A box. That, then let me first introduce the, uh, our distinguished panels that are especially brought to you by the organization. The first panel is Dr. Prasad Asantachai, Deputy Dean of, Fed, of Faculty of Medicine, Sira Raj Hospital, Mahidol University, Thailand. Professor Asantai is a well-known figure in geriatric medicine in the region and is the, region, is the chair of the Asia Oceania International Association of Gerontology and Geriatric from 2015 to 2020. Mr. Dr. Prashad, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for your kind invitation. Konnichiwa. Good afternoon to our distinguished uh, member and guests. Uh, I think uh, before we're going to talk about the translating data, next slide please. The target of discussion today is, is to, to develop and harness innovative new technology and how technology can be translated and transfer. But the question come out that which one are needed by all the people? Which one? It's quite, uh, it's quite hard. So I'll give you some three principles. The first one is the unique features of older patients. Older patients is not the, the adult with gray hair. They have some unique features, such what we call WAMs. R stands for reduced body reserve. A, a typical presentation or the syndrome. M is multiple pathology. P, polypharmacy. And S is social adversity. These are the unique features of older patients, different from normal adult. And the second principle is that, next slide please, what we call genetic syndrome. It begins with I, with such as insanity or fall, immobility, intuitive impairment such as dementia or delirium or depression. Incontinence, that means no people pass urine or stool involuntarily. In addition, or anorexia or malnutrition, insomnia or inability to sleep, atherogenesis, and the last one is sarcopenia and frailty. These are the, 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 the two. And, and the, last, the last principle is there. what is the medicine? This is a, the general medicine. It's not the organ specialist. It deals with four aspects, four interventions, clinical, both physical and mental, rehabilitation, social and prevention. With all these three principles all together, next slide please. I tablet 
in in this uh, uh, in this uh, matrix. So you can see the ramps on the, the x-axis and the i in in the y-axis. And in uh, please, please let me allow me to stand up. And you can see each cell we can pick up which one ca can be needed in front of all the people, such as in the first cell sarcopenia is it, the cause of fall and because of the weekend, being of the muscle, meaning getting older. So is there any innovation for this? Next slide, please. You can see we can develop something uh, to help uh, get training, such as space walker. Next slide. Or even the exoskeletal to improve. This one can be used for rehabilitation for those who fall. The next one. And even in the, the, the computer, uh, software so that uh, the, the older people can stand on the, on the platform and the platform can sense the, the pressure and the, the send a signal to, to the screen and we will let the older people to try to balance the exercise to prevent fall. Next slide please. Now another one really important is food innovation because older people suffer from swallowing difficulty. Next, next slide. So we need innovation, food innovation. It is look nice tasty and easy to swallow for other people. Next run. Uh, fall, because of, it can be a typical presentation such as uh, fall without any causes. So we need some very sensitive sensor. Next slide please. Such as in this picture, this is the special shoe with a sensor embedded inside. It can sense the pressure to, to the computer and if something wrong, it can sense the signal to the doctors or to the caregiver to know that something is going wrong to prevent fall. Next slide, please. Another one is uh, it's quite easy. Uh, we all know that in a car, we have the safety back to prevent when the car crash. And this one as well, if the people swear, tend to fall and an airbag in, in this bell will come out to, to prevent hip fracture. Next slide, please. And at the sale, because of so many diseases that can cause fall, so we need holistic care in management. Let's say if the people have five diseases, they have to go to five clinics. It's not easy, it's not, it's not friendly to all the people. So we need some innovation for holistic care, even the telemedicine to you or any connectivity to, between each discipline of medicines. P, polypharmacy. Many diseases, many drugs can cause fall. So we need the, some system to drug alert system or even the drug interaction application in a, in, in a cell phone. And as the social adversity, in, in this part, I will leave to Professor uh, Chong King Hua in the next panel. We, we can talk all this better than me. The next one is, it, is it the, the design that Professor Chong King Hua will, will talk about later on. Next slide. It's another one to uh, prevent uh, immobility or even the, the depression. It is uh, something like the, the robot. So that to put people who live alone. <coughs> Next slide, please. And another one in this cell, immobility. Because of people maybe tend to uh, can walk or walk slowly, we can use some innovation such as this one. This is a vehicle design. It can push and when, when they get fatigued, it can then get constantly can sit on this seat or even they keep something on this box and even some side cycle to go in anywhere they want. <coughs> Next slide, please. Another one is uh, how to prevent immobility syndrome. You see, because if people cannot walk, they suffer from pressure ulcer, muscle weakness, joint contracture. Next slide, please. So we have some innovation to, to try to move the, the, the bed of the people with this remote sensor. But it's not, it's not good enough. It's just up and down. I prefer that the next generation should be, it can toss to the side, toss to the side, left or right, something like that to prevent pressure ulcer. Next slide. <laughs> and it's, again, so many diseases uh, can cause immobility. So we use the same platform as the previous one. The, the next, the, sorry, this one continents. Uh, people tend to pass urine, uh, especially when they cough, 
to 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 strong, and we can uh, do exercise. We call this exercise. Next slide, please. This is the pelvic muscle. And it, it it get really weak in older people. But if we can exercise it, it, it can strong stronger and it can stop incontinence. But the problem is it's quite hard for doctor to tell a grandma who at 85 years old to, to do the exercise. They don't understand how, how to do it. So we need innovation, innovation to how to monitor the exercise of this pelvic muscle. Next slide. Dapper humid sensor. Uh, people with incontinence suffer from many things from diaper. Next slide, please. You can see this is the diaper dermatitis. When they wear the diaper for too long and they have so many urine, and diaper is, is, is too small to collect all the urine from the old people, and it comes out like this. Even in, in women, they can get some infection. You see. So that is not good for older people, but how to how to use it? I think the next innovation is that we should invent something such as sensor in, in diaper that oh it's time to change now, it's time to change now. Otherwise, you will suffer from this. <coughs> and this two is the same as I said before. The next one is intellectual impairment, dementia. Uh, so many things about the. The, the marker of dementia, but the 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 very things that talk about is the cognitive training, such as smartphone, we virtual reality. Next slide. Uh, there is some study show that cognitive training can enhance innovative thinking in older people. This next slide, and another platform also talk about this. Next slide. Such as virtual reality is now uh, tend to improve the cognitive function in older people. We need this. Next one, even gamification or playing games, it can do good to the brain as well. Next one, uh, even the, in the depression, uh, we can meet, sometimes we need the CCTV for the family to, to talk with, with their grandparents or even the valuable device. So that we can let them go outside rather than just sit on the house, especially during this pandemic. Next slide. So when, they let, when we let them go outside, we can track them to all this system. So that they, they cannot get lost. So we need this. The next one. <coughs> uh, and you, you see, uh, the dementia diagnosis. Nowadays, we use uh, MRI, but so many types of dementia can cause dementia. Uh, it's quite hard for doctors to diagnose. So we need AI for the dementia diagnosis from that MRI. And, it, and next one is uh, alienation. The full innovation I talked about already. But anything is uh, people get weight loss without awareness. So we need innovation to track. Oh, now you, your weight loss is critical now. You should go to see a doctor, something like that. So we need innovation in this. And insomnia, we need sleep promoter. Sleep apnea is quite a common in older people. Next slide, please. So is it a valuable device? Can we take this? Next one. Right. So another one is really important is the environment. The light adaptation, such as amber light, can promote sleep. Right. So when we use all this platform, we can tap it itself that which innovation is needed. Next slide. So I said, uh, at the moment, we heard, heard about the ASEAN Center for Active Aging and Innovation, or AKI. AKI is a 10 countries. That's in, uh, uh, we sit together. Uh, Thai, Thailand uh, has uh, initiated this idea, and it started this year. Uh, it, it should be as a change agent to do what Professor Wong just said uh, to us that, how to uh, go in together. Next slide, please. Especially for older people. Next one. The, the very first uh, uh, things that we should do is use to develop ASEAN Aging Index. In this way, we can track each part of aging in each country. So su suppose that this one area is lucky high and the countries, I think the government cannot sit still. They, they have to act something to do something. Next slide, please. 
Like in Europe, they have zero internet. Next slide. Right, it can with AKI we can join project with the same internet such, such as the Arwin. Next slide. And public private partnership is very really important in for Arkai. Thank you so much. He's the founder and chief CEO and CEO of Quality Electro Dynamics. Mr. Fujika is also the chief technology officer of CTMR MR division of Canon Medical Systems Corporation. And he is also the health innovation ambassador for uh, OIST. Uh, let me ask uh, Dr. Uh, Fujika in terms of the questions on your background of, of uh, in the business of uh, technology and development. What would, you, what would be, can you share your experience with us in terms of transferring and uh, translating the research that you do into policy and practice to, uh, with the audience, please? Sure. Excuse me, uh, can you hear me okay? All right. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for having me and uh, it's my pleasure to be here. And uh, um, the question was, uh, you know, um, how did uh, my research experience turn into a uh, business uh, for healthcare sector? So uh, let me try to answer the question briefly. Um, I, uh, um, you know, uh, left for the United States back in 1988. I was a uh, college student at uh, Waseda University at that time, uh, School of Engineering. And um, uh, I uh, went to the U.S. and then found out that uh, there are many degrees of freedoms which allowed me to uh, participate in different uh, disciplines as opposed to just one subject, you know. Uh, in the U.S., if you want to uh, study many different subjects, actually, you could do that. And uh, I was, uh, you know, uh, fascinated by that opportunity. So um, I was, uh, you know, doing physics and mathematics. But uh, as I studied, uh, uh, you know, those uh, uh, two subjects, I became uh, more interested in the intersection between engineering and uh, medicine. So um, after I finished my PhD uh, in physics at Case Western Reserve, I had an offer to, uh, you know, uh, work at a uh, diagnostic imaging uh, company as a research uh, uh, staff scientist. So my job was to, at that time, uh, do the research and uh, create a uh, better, uh, a superior uh, MRI scanners for, uh, uh, for the community. So uh, I've been engaged with, with uh, you know, MRI research for many, many years. Um, there was a um, um, opportunity, a startup opportunity while I was working at the diagnostic imaging company. And uh, I took that uh, startup opportunity to, to start a business with the founder. And uh, that was still on the medical devices. And um, uh, that company became uh, a GE um, through the acquisition. So I became a, a part of the management of uh, GE Medical Systems. And I was there for some years and did, uh, uh, you know, tried many different, uh, uh, you know, projects which was a great uh, experience to me. But uh, at that point, I felt that um, I could start my own medical imaging company based upon all the you know, experiences I, I, I have got up to that point. So um, you know, I started uh, uh, this quality electrodynamics or QED back in 2006 and uh, started developing a next generation MRI scanners and technologies to basically see things better, right? Because imaging is all about seeing things better. So, um, you know, um, we uh, uh, developed technologies and then we worked with uh, Siemens GE Toshiba at that time, now which, is, uh, which has become Canon Medical Systems through the acquisition. But uh, um, our company, QED, has been still a uh, leading technology provider to these uh, OEMs. But back in 2009, uh, 19, just before the COVID-19 hit us, um, we uh, QED became a part of uh, Canon Inc. 
And uh, because Canon was uh, basically shifting from a imaging pictures, camera businesses to uh, diagnostic imaging, more healthcare related uh, businesses as you know, as a, a one of the core businesses to pursue. So uh, in that uh, uh, framework, we became a, a part of, uh, you know, uh, a Canon. And then I serve as a CTO of Canon Medical Systems for CTMR division. So once again, we are trying to develop uh, uh, imaging equipment or diagnostic imaging systems, which allow, you know, us to doctors to see patients uh, 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 better because if we can detect the diseases at the earlier stages, the cost will be less and uh, we could provide um, uh, more opportunities for the patient to live longer in a healthy way. So that's our lifeline. So I, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but uh, so from physics to all the way to uh, uh, medical imaging, that's what I do. Thank you. So we now move to the our third speaker, which is uh, from ITU. He is uh, Mr. Ashish Nadarian. Can are you on now? We are uh, yes. online. Yes. Okay. Uh, I would like to ask you a question on about uh, asking you about I ITU and wh what what does ITU do? And also, uh, re uh, we had a recent research, research report on aging in digital world from vulnerable to valuable. Why is it important to address the digital divide and what are some ways that we might do so from your experience? Thank you very much, uh, moderators, uh, Madam Moderator and Honorable Participants. It's been an absolute great learning experience listening to the, the talk that we have been going and the importance of aging. Uh, if you would allow me, I've got a set of small slides to uh, to answer this very important question. Uh, can I have the slides, please? So ITU is a UN is a UN agency, and it is the first UN agency, the oldest one existing today, called the International Telecommunication Union. Uh, next slide, please. And I come from the Asia Pacific Regional Office. So if you can see, it's a specialized agency of the UN on ICTs, just like we heard uh, our WHO colleague, which is a specialized, specialized agency on health. And uh, time and again, we have emphasized the importance of digital health. And that's where we work very closely with our uh, sister agency, WHO and other partners. Uh, ITU has three different sectors. First is the radio communication, where you know we are talking about satellites, 4G, 5G, Wi-Fi, all those uh, kinds of uh, various technologies that come together and the spectrum part of it. Then we've got the standardization sector, which is ITU is a formal standardization organization for uh, the telecom and the uh, ICT sector. And then the development sector where I come from. So it is here where, uh, you know, all parts of these sectors, it's a, it's a, it's a agency, which, ha which is a UN agency. Uh, it has all the 193 member states and also industry research organization and academia as a member. So it's really a platform where all these uh, different entities can come together. Next, please. So I'll uh, zoom on quickly to uh, digital health because that's what we are discussing. And you know, if it's digital, then us, so we are basically responsible for the digital side of things. So recently we concluded our uh, plenipotentiary conference. I mean, this is a conference where more than 180 countries came together and they, they decide the next strategic plan. I mean, what should we be looking at the institution, the membership? And, uh, you know, this is a snapshot of uh, the emphasis that we've been talking about what the pandemic did. And the countries adopted a, re uh, a new resolution on how we can use technology in, in mitigating global pandemics as a result of this. Next, please. This is a snapshot of what we have been doing. I mean, as ITU or, and together with our sister agency, WHO, um, I mean, we have, all, um, we have created a common guide, digital health strategy guide that WHO and ITU had created. And if you see the BHBM, which is Be Healthy, Be Mobile handbooks, one of them, which is important one, which is relevant to our discussion today is M Aging Handbook. And how do we use technology in an assistive manner that, to manage aging, uh, and you know, when I was listening to uh, to Professor from uh, from Thailand and Professor Wong, this was great. Um, we I, I learned a lot, and I think this is 
a right time for, uh, you know, where we can start working with uh, organizations such as uh, HWIN, EKI, and others to see how uh, we can, you know, uh, bring the learning here uh, with the practices that's happening and the new research. Thank you very much. Next, please. So uh, if you look at uh, recent research by uh, World Broadband Association, so broadband access, advanced education, sorry, can we go back to please? Yes. So we see this negative correlation between COVID mortality and broadband access, advanced education, income, and ability. So when we uh, increase broadband penetration or digitalization, then we see a better um, healthcare and we, we see less, we see a reduction in, uh, in the deaths. Uh, related to COVID. And, you know, that's obvious because that could help us connect better and do things and address things in a more timely manner, give more information as we go on. Uh, next, please. So in this context, you know, we are, um, there are two projects that we are con currently considering. I mean, the first is how do we look at sustainable post-COVID-19 recovery and development of uh, resilient digital infrastructure? So the digital infrastructure needs to be resilient. I mean, one of uh, my former secretary generals used to say that, you know, if the if you've got a problem in the digital infrastructure, you run the risk of being killed by your own doctor. And so the quality of transmission, the quality of uh, service, the reliability of the service is extremely important. And, the, you know, we've got uh, programs called smart cities, smart villages, smart islands, where remote communities are being connected. And when we get to that and do some needs analysis, what we found out is that digital health is one of the common things that's required right across, and that results in saving lives. Uh, so this project objective is to leverage digital technologies in establishing and uh, you know, expanding the resilient ICT connectivity to hospitals. Um, and in developing countries, there are uh, serious issues of interoperability of systems, improving the connectivity to these hospitals and to remote dispensaries and how they can talk to each other in terms of information transfer from the communities to the databases so that you know information can be prepared and vice versa. We come back with telemedicine uh, and also related sectors like the pharmacy. How can medicines be available in a timely manner? Then uh, we need to build uh, upon the quality, as I was mentioning, the quality of internet uh, connection and reliability of sensors, information, technology at the grassroots level, which can feed into better planning and which can feed into better diagnosis and better response by the community as a whole. Next, please. The second is on innovating for digital health in Asia Pacific. This is a second project objective which I'm looking at which is the improving the ability of digital health innovators to become social entrepreneurs and deploy their solutions. And then enhancing the capacity amongst patients. And, you know, I was very glad to see uh, the previous presentation where we were talking about the need for, uh, you know, better sensing, early diagnosis on digital health, using emerging technologies like IOTs, AIs, uh, blockchains uh, to, to give us, to enable the, the decision making. Next, please. So I'll just conclude. I mean, this is the focus. The WHO and ITU jointly developed this Be Healthy, Be Mobile Imaging Handbook. It elaborates on how phones and technologies can be used for delivering health information advice and uh, and reminders at community level. Uh, and this is very important. And I think this is. Uh, this is what we must be looking at, and we would be very uh, happy to work with organizations or interested partners in this area. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Over to you. Thank you. So we have all four, three presenters presented their ideas, and now I would like to ask, uh, I would like to uh, ask a question regarding the innovation and technology for uh, to the panelists and also uh, after that we will open the floor for question and answers given that uh, we have uh, shown that uh, dr prof uh, mentioned about technology must meet the needs of the older person and also the uh, the development of dr fujika in terms of his experience doing research and going into the business of uh, of uh, technology and and also he's also a member of the uh, uh, the uh, cleveland uh, Cent uh, what do you call the cleveland center in us and being commuting 
from uh, from Japan to US in terms of developing this technology to be relevant to both countries. And let me ask you a question in terms of what are the resources or the facilities that are needed so that there is regional cooperation to bring Asia to get together to facilitate health technology development so that the older person are also inclusive in the design and accept, uh, in the design and also usability of the technology. Uh, I'm opening this question to all the panelists. Anyone can answer? Yes, first. Okay, let, let me first. I think uh, because uh, uh, Jetishin, as Professor Wong said, that very few doctors like to be trained in genetic medicine. So, very few doctors will, will just in this area. So, it, it depends on uh, the government level. But in, in Thailand, uh, we are lucky because uh, we start the, the national program for aging at the year 1982, the same as the, the World Health Assembly, the, the first World Assembly. At that time, uh, we have the, the first national plan for aging. And right now, we have two, two plans now. The, the second one just finished last year. We can, we're going to start the, 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 the third one. So I think uh, the, it, it should be from the top in, 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 in Asian countries because in, in, in for the bottom level, such as social worker or healthcare worker, they tend to stick on their own special specialty, you see. So I think this is my opinion. Any other? Prof, should you tell you want to respond to that? Any other questions? Sure. So um, the question was, um, um, how do we make these technologies available yes. to everybody, right? right? That is the question, yes. right? Yes. So I think, um, uh, uh, you know, I, I would have opportunity to talk about this a uh, uh, few minutes, in a few minutes. But uh, for example, um, I have a book um, which is uh, um, entitled The Great Age Reboot. And uh, this was recently published by the uh, Cleveland Clinic Chief Wellness Officer, Dr. Michael Roizen, together with uh, a great uh, you know, uh, uh, leaders in, in the in American community, Albert Ratner. He's actually 94 years old. And uh, uh, what uh, they have been emphasizing is that longevity is a key to all the you know, future potentials this human uh, society has. So uh, to, your, to answer your question, what is this, right? You can Google it, but uh, uh, this is a uh, personalized platform that uh, you can access through iPhone, right? And then over time, actually, it will tell you, it will guide you throughout everyday activities and uh, uh, nutrition, what uh, uh, you must eat and then, you know, how to eat and then what exercise you want to do. So eventually it will become a, like uh, your health passport. So, um, you know, since we do have this uh, global technology, you know, uh, community through internet and everything, Everything is connected. So, uh, uh, you know, at some point, I think everybody can access to the, this technology, for example. I'm not saying that this is it, but uh, this is one of the many examples that we can talk about as the outcome of, of a technology, you know, uh, development. So uh, that way, I think people will be able to, you know, access to uh, these technologies, addressing uh, uh, technology, you know, uh, a divide, which, you know, our keynote speaker also talked about. So that's a challenge. But that's something where the government can come and uh, uh, you know um, uh, develop the platform and the environment and community, mm -hmm. so that uh, um, it will become easier for everybody to access. I think it's it's going to be a part of a part of national policy. Okay. So, uh, for, uh, Dr. Asha, do you want to add any response to the questions on technology usage and cooperation in the region? Yeah. Sorry, it's to me, Madam Auditor. Uh, okay, uh, yeah. So first of all, apologies. I'm not a doctor, so uh, I'm 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 from the engineering side. So okay. let me come Sorry. back and uh, um, yes, I think one of the key thing is is we have to make firstly make available whatever we are doing in the digital world accessible, 
And when we say accessible, we have to include the aging population. I mean, I myself am aging. So if I don't put my glasses on, now I can't read my mobile phone. So what we need to do is, uh, because as we shift to the new digital, uh, we need to assess and adopt strong accessibility standards to any digital services or any digital things that we are introducing. This is on the customer side and the awareness. I mean, many times we find out that the solution exists, it's already aware, but people don't know. And that kind of thing needs to be very heavily promoted where there is a role for everybody. Uh, what we need perhaps in all this cross-sectoral, let's say, is the whole of government and whole of society approach as was uh, mentioned earlier. And that is very important. Uh, we are, um, I to quote an example, for example, we, uh, we run smart village and smart island programs, which brings together multiple services to a very remote or rural community. And what we have found out is if we did digital literacy and digital awareness, to the population that's already aware, it becomes very easy for our other uh, sister agencies and other partners to deliver on those verticals. So I think building mass awareness on digital literacy, online safety, access to the services, keeping accessibility in mind is the first thing. Second is adopting standards on devices that are friendly to aging. So when, uh, for example, if, uh, if we are developing websites, if you're ordering handsets, if you're developing applications and services, then those should be friendly to the aging population. And there were some very nice suggestions, which I totally agree with, so I don't want to repeat myself, but standardization, technology interoperability, cross-sectoral collaboration, in my view, is the key. Thank you. Thank you. And skills development, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, and I can now open to the uh, uh, audience if you if you want have any questions. Uh, do you have any online Q and A? Okay. Any? Yes. Sir. So, uh, thank you very much for those great talks from all three panelists. Um, perhaps I can just share that. Uh, you know, I think that broadband access is probably, as the last speaker mentioned, it's actually a super determinant of health, because now it's becoming harder and harder to access healthcare, even shopping for groceries, uh, getting educated without broadband access. But I think one of the biggest challenges we have are probably, I can think of two. One is that a lot of digital technology is being developed actually by young engineers. And so a lot of technology is being developed by a younger generation for an older generation. And the, the user interface becomes a huge issue. So how do we get older people to be actively involved in the design of products at the very beginning? The second is with broadband access, we have seen huge amounts of misinformation and financial insecurity because of financial scams. So I don't know about in Japan and other countries, but in Singapore, a lot of our elderly people lost a lot of money through financial scams, which were actually propagated because of digital access. So I think that you know, while broadband access is a universal determinant of health, we do need to look at very strong security. We need to address the mis misinformation and we need co-design from the very start. Otherwise, it's a younger generation developing products for an older generation uh, and the digital divide just becomes worse. Thank you. Response from you all. I agree with the comment, Provong, because even in Malaysia, we do have a lot of scams and they are, and older persons are very scared now in terms of using technology for that. Yeah. So, yeah. so uh, you know, to your uh, point, I think that that's the reason the society has to become more inclusive, right? And uh, as, uh, as we age, I think uh, if we can create a community where everybody can work together so that uh, you know uh, uh, wisdom of uh, older people 
you know, will become the part of uh, young generations, uh, you know, encouragement and uh, uh, some hints and uh, motivation. So I think uh, uh, you have already talked about during your presentation that, uh, you know, everything has to become inclusive. I, I think that's a key. Can I, can I come in? Uh, Ashin? Madam Moderator? Yes. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Uh, I totally agree. This is, this was a very, these two are very, very important uh, issues. And actually we experienced this when we did the needs analysis on what is needed on digital awareness and skills at the community level. And um, we saw that there was a gap of online safety. So when people go online, I mean, I mean, let's even, let's forget the community, even amongst a lot of educated and city living population, uh, they don't know what will happen if their account is hacked, or they don't know what to do if uh, you get an OTP and somebody is asking, calling you to get you the OTP. So keeping that in mind, we designed an online safety module, uh, which takes into account these practical challenges. And we are trying to roll it out together with all our smart villages and all community-based information that uh, we try to do. So yes, the point is very well valid. The issue of designing is also very well valid. And going forward, um, these recommendations are very important. And I think everyone should take this into account um, as we step into this, uh, to solve this aging, uh, living nicely in, in an aging society. I mean, this is very important. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have I have a question in uh, relation to what uh, Prof Wong mentioned because I think in our syllabus in our education of our engineers and things like that we are very uh, we are very uh, feel discipline oriented and not going beyond our discipline. So I think it, I think it, in looking forward for for aging society and development for usable uh, technologies and things like that maybe we, there is a need now for us to relook at the curriculum where you need to incorporate population aging issue as part of the syllabus for the engineers and also doctors because uh, definitely in 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 education there's so much of information that you we want to, to part to, to our students, and yet we forgot that the other portions of the information are also important. So what do you think about the reorientation of syllabus in uh, academic uh, programs to, to incorporate aging as, as much as possible into the curriculum uh, of, uh, for the future? Can, can anyone of you answer that? Yes, I agree with you. Uh, that's why I try to encourage um, Asian countries as much as possible to, to incorporate genetic medicine in their curriculum. And even in my medical school, uh, medical students can learn just not just medicine, they can choose some subjects such as uh, computer design, something like that, or even business, something like that, so that they can have uh, many aspects of knowledge to cope with the current uh, demand, mm -hmm. right? So this is really important, but, but, but maybe call pie shape learning, pie shape. Okay. Thank you. Um, um, we will have a presentation by Dr. Fujika in, in terms of uh, before we end the session. Do you, do, you, do you have a presentation to do? Yeah. So uh, thank you, I'll be brief, but uh, today's topic is this, the power of technology for healthy aging in Asia. And actually, this Asia should be extended to the entire world, right? I mean, for our discussion. And, uh, um, you know, when you look at the history of uh, uh, our society, actually, the last disruptor or innovation was the uh, in invention of chip or integrated circuit, right? Which was the reason why we do have these iPhones all these technologies are available and everybody is connected through chip. So that was a disruptor. But the newest disruptor actually is the longevity. Why? Because longevity makes you know, life happier and healthy for you know, adding 20 more working years to the 40 years we now generally work, right? I mean, after we graduate from college, we often work for 40 some years but with these technologies and uh, uh, discoveries made in medicine 
actually we are adding on the average 20 more years. So the question is, how do we make sure that uh, we age in a healthy way so that we become part of the uh, contributions to our society? So those new discoveries in medicine, in aging research are largely based on progress from the Human Genome Project. I, I'm sure you have heard of it before. You know, uh, when started, we expected uh, 300,000 genes based on quantity of DNA in nuclei, found about 22,500 genes. And what was the rest of DNA? We called junk DNA initially at that time. But eight years later, junk DNA was found to be switched, switches called epigenes that controlled if genes were producing proteins or not. All genes do is make proteins or watch other genes. Only about 1,500 genes out of 22,500 are turned on or making proteins at any one point. So which genes are on and off, it's largely under our control. So for example, when you manage stress, you turn off genes that promote inflammatory proteins. So we have now come to understand these uh, you know, genes and DNAs, uh, out of DNAs. These are the reasons why we can do, for example, gene editing, right? We can manipulate genes to illuminate some unwanted part of the genes, right? which actually leads to a longevity. So actually, um, this research already uh, uh, shows that uh, gene editing has proven to change aging in at least two animal species. And uh, these changes are moving into human trials now. So the more will happen in the coming years. And then we are guaranteed to live longer so I want to I want to stop the uh, part of this science discussion because that's something you know very well. I want to focus for the remaining two minutes or so to talk about economics uh, of the longevity. So, as we talked about, um, our retirement is often 60 to 65 years old today, uh, today but we are adding 20 more years. Uh, um, you know, as part of our, our lifespan, healthy lifespan. So longer, healthier, and more productive lives increase human capital. Human capital generates innovation, entrepreneurship, productivity, and growth. Human capital is the ultimate wealth of the nation. That's how we should see it. We cannot afford to waste human capital which is what happens when we lose health and die prematurely. We cannot afford not to live longer and healthier lives. People who are productive more years are generally extending their most productive years. Death rate will decline from 9.2 per thousand to 2.3 per thousand. We forecast a population increase of 170 million by 2015, 2050 because of longevity. Now, what does this mean to our society in an uh, uh, you know, economics way? If every worker over 55 today works just one more year, it would increase GDP by about 1.5% annum. This is more than 300 billion per year to spend on our personal and societal priorities. If people are going to live an additional 10 to 20 healthy years, they will choose to work at least five of these years. This would still mean typical retirement ages of 67 to 75, leaving plenty of time for the joys of a retired life. Working additional five years is an increase of 10 to 20% of a person's lifetime productivity. This is 
200,000 USD to 400,000 USD per person. This is two to four trillion of health created values. I think, uh, you know, CHIP did uh, um, this uh, tremendous impact to our society. But now we are talking about this health created value. If they work five more years, it is additional 1.75 trillion a year to spend on our personal and societal priorities. If they work 10 more years, it is additional 3.5 trillion a year to spend on our personal and uh, societal priorities. So key takeaway is that among all the things we can talk about, we can, we can compare, there is nothing which comes close to health created value. This amount of uh, you know, financial impact globally, it's the biggest by far. That's the reason it's the biggest, actually newest disruptor of our human society. Well, about a week ago, um, I had the pleasure to uh, you know, participate in the Cleveland Clinic and the Okinawa Institute of Science, Te Science and Technology Graduate School MOU signing ceremony, where, as you may know, Cleveland Clinic ha um, has 78,000 uh, caregivers worldwide. And uh, I, 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 I serve on the board of uh, uh, trustees. I'm actually chairman of the board at uh, uh, Hillcrest Hospital, Cleveland Clinic. And uh, uh, what we are trying to do is that we try to create healthy aging institute in Okinawa. Okinawa is, you know, one of the most blue zones in the whole world. And um, I think, um, as I said, this will drive our society in, in every aspect. So the key word is health created value in a global way. So uh, Wiza, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for uh, explanation from Jean and how it will save uh, if we keep on our healthy longevity, how, how we will contribute to the economy and things like that. So I think I will wrap up, wrap up the session because from what we have heard from genomics and, and the creation of economies and also the, the kind of innovation that we need to do so that it will match the needs of the older person and the contribution of it to society. And, uh, and, and to me, it is very imp important for all of us to invest in this uh, uh, ecosystem of research and technology, and also to, to also have the platform where the governments are encouraging uh, people to, to investigate in, 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 this issue, in, in this issue, because many of us and many countries do not have the proper platform and also the capacity for us to do research and innovate. So I think this, for, this forum, has already brought us some, some aspects that we need to think about together. And as an international forum, we can collaborate with each other to promote this issue of aging and technology. And so that the digital divide and improvement in the lives of the person will be extend with technology uses. So I'd like to uh, invite all of you to, uh, to uh, congratulate the distinguished panel speakers for today for this session. Thank you very much. In the usual manner. Thank you very much to our panelists and our moderator and also our audience for this fruitful discussion. We will now welcome our second panel to the stage. For this panel, we have Professor Chong Keng Hua from the Singapore University of Technology and Design and Professor Katsunori Kondo from the Graduate School of Medicine at Chiba University. They will be discussing the design of age-friendly cities to facilitate mobility and social inclusion. We have invited our keynote speaker, Professor Zhang Wang, to serve as a discussant for this panel. Once again, we plan to take questions from the audience at the end. For this session, our moderator is Ms. Momoko Abe, 
Program Officer for JCIE's Healthy Aging in Asia program, who has played a central role in organizing today's events. Ms. Abe, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ms. Kashiwagi. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to start the second panel of the day titled Designing Age-Friendly Cities, Facilitating Mobility and Social Inclusion. So what makes an age-friendly city? An age-friendly city should be designed for diversity, inclusion, and cohesion, addressing the needs of all ages and capacities, including, for example, barrier-free access to buildings and houses, accessible and safe transport infrastructure. While what makes an age-friendly city covers many elements, the session today will focus particularly on social architecture design and mobility and transportation, and how these aspects affect the health of older people. So through the, today's discussion, I hope we could rethink communities that could enable people to stay active and connected and foster intergenerational solidarity among the growing older population and future generations. So without further ado, I'm pleased to announce um, or introduce our speakers for this panel who are distinguished experts in this field. So let me first call upon Mr. Chong Ken Hua. And uh, Mr. Chong is Associate Professor of Architecture and Sustainable Design at the Singapore University of Technology and Design. He currently conducts research on urban design and community development for physical health, mental well-being, and dementia inclusivity. He is a firm believer in design ac activism and has been advocating social architecture and community design in the region and has led several community development projects in Vietnam, Thailand, and China. Mr. Chong, please. Thank you. Thanks for having me here. Thank you, Ms. Momoko. Um, well, my sharing will build on what Prof Wong has shared earlier on inclusivity, on aging in community, not just aging in place, and also about active living. Next. Uh, first, uh, just one a little bit introduction myself. I, I joined this university, Young University, Singapore University of Technology and Design, we call SUTD. 10 years ago, uh, 10 over years, uh, and I was asked what would I want to research in. Um, as a young faculty, I came out with the word aging, and that was quite surprising for some, but it wasn't so surprised after a few years. Everybody was talking about it. So I started this lab called Social Urban Lab, in short called SoLab. Next. So in Singapore, uh, one in four, about one in four, will become seniors in 2030. That's not far from now. Uh, but in 2050, next, it'll be one in three. We are chasing Japan, but I hope that this, this is not a competition. Uh, but we are learning from uh, many of you here today, including myself. The first stop that I started this research 10 years ago was to come to Japan to do field study. Next. But when I look back in Singapore, what do we have, the kind of spaces as an architect trained in architecture, and teaching architecture, uh, we see this kind of spaces. This is a senior, um, senior citizen corner, as you can see. Uh, but uh, there's no seniors there. There's a row of chairs, and this is where the seniors are. Um, so we find it very peculiar. Where are all the seniors and where do they hang out? They hang out in next to the Hawker Center, bring their own plastic chairs, sitting uh, in front of this uh, water uh, meter. They hang out in the most unexpected spaces next. You see in the drop-off point, you see in the uh, shelter link way, you see under the void there in the high-rise uh, high housing block, you see in the uh, leftover spaces where they are doing gardening. So we start to wonder how can we create a more age-friendly and age-empowered uh, place for all of them, right? So some of these spaces in the end will come back, will come back to as in our design development as well. Uh, interestingly, you can see, for example, the drop-off point uh, the uh, seniors are just hanging out, uh, watching the cars and people are coming in and go and commenting about them. Uh, people are setting up their own pavilion at the uh, um, sheltering wake, putting in their own solar panel, you can see, to charge their phone. 
So there's so much more the designer can do, but I think, are we doing that? Next. Uh, but you also can see sometimes this kind of uh, behavior. Uh, I'll just read here. Please return my flowers that you have taken, otherwise something will happen to you. Thank you. Please don't take away any plants from here. <laughs> so we also see a lot of tension in public space. How do we mitigate this kind of ownership and co-ownership of public space is something that we try to attempt to. So in our research and design framework, we developed this core design process, something that Prof Wong also emphasized earlier. How do we co-develop design together with the aging population? Uh, so again, 10 years ago when I was still younger, uh, it's very hard for me to conceive what kind of needs and requirements and aspiration of our senior uh, citizen. And therefore we engage a series of uh, process and develop this core design process. First, we look at design ethnography, how design can actually learn more uh, through qualitative and quantitative analysis, through core learning to participatory analytics, to the core design process and change into our environment through place making and place keeping. I'll share a little bit more through the case studies. Next. And this is the field work that we have conducted uh, almost 10 years ago, uh, but we published this, this book called Creative Aging Cities, where we studied six uh, cities together with our collaborators. And one of them is uh, in Japan, in uh, Tokyo. I walk around with my young researchers to understand how the uh, Japanese population, uh, senior population are coping. And one of the examples, also quoted by Prof Wong, is this uh, Ibasho. Uh, we also visited the uh, Dream of Mizumi, uh, the Senior Citizen Centre, and incorporate some of this idea back home. So you can uh, find some of the case studies here. Next. So uh, when we first started uh, conduct our design infography, we asked, well, what are the aspirations of our aging population? We learned from uh, other scholars, uh, for example, uh, by, uh, by Scala, this 5C framework. Next. So these are the 5C uh, that we learned from continuity, compensation, connection, contribution, and challenge. Singapore has done pretty well in the first two, connect, uh, continuity and compensation, uh, but we didn't do so well in the last three. So we wonder how can we bring it together. We study different concepts. Next, uh, aging in place, age friendly, and active aging. Uh, of course, as I mentioned, aging in place is something that we have really focused on in the past decade. But what about aging in community? A concept that was emerging in the past few years that bring together all these different concepts in a more active aging way, a more creative aging way, I would say. Um, yeah, so we can shift from homebound to community enabled, from independence to interdependence. How do we work together with each other? From universal design, uh, do adaptive design. So beyond the barrier free, but what about adaptive, uh, adaptiveness of the space itself? And to shift from design for to design with. So the next slide will show you all the series of workshop and uh, conversation interview that we have together with uh, our senior population, and many of them remain friends until now. Uh, we also devised many other ad methods, uh, especially one of the methods we call Jigsaw Moodboard. We'll show you later. Next. So just to want to share some of the projects that we've done together with our agency. This is do, done with, together with Housing Development Board to reimagine the new kinds of uh, community living room under the uh, high-rise housing block. Uh, this is done with our Jurong East Ihua community. Next. Uh, we have also worked with different private sector to reimagine a new type of senior wellness center. This is at a studio apartment with NTUC Health. Next. Uh, we also work with uh, ADA, uh, now called Dementia Singapore, to reimagine uh, their center. Uh, in the past, uh, just to give you a context, this used to be a full wall that you can't really see out and nobody can see in because of privacy. But we developed this new double uh, layers kind of wall where the uh, handicraft that the seniors was doing will then contribute to become the uh, kind of gallery that people can see from outside and appreciate what they're doing at the same time provide some kind of privacy for them and they like to walk around this area because they get the sun and see the kids outside so we designed this design uh, approach uh, called a 4D uh, de-institutionalization to bring down the healthcare to community level Delocalize to shift away from a very localized based kind of a public space to a more interest based cross generation kind of public space. 
uh, to differentiate the uh, personal care from medical care so that we can have more types of uh, assisted living environment, which I think the government is doing a lot more now. And development, to focus on self-development and growth uh, so that we can continue to grow even though we are old. Thanks. Uh, with that, uh, we brought in uh, some metaphor as a design uh, concept as well. Well, this concept came from a very traditional Chinese medicine uh, approach called the acupuncture, but we changed the first three letters, AQ to Aki, which will stand for architecture. And how architecture can perform as acupuncture to improve the health of the city. Next. Uh, first case study I want to show is to work with an uh, uh, organization called Touch Community Services, uh, an organization that provides this kind of uh, social services for the elderly. So we developed a new way of bringing together different types of spaces in the uh, housing block that the resident, 80% of the population uh, is living in. So a lot of uh, requests from the seniors say that they don't want to be cooped inside the interior space because that's what most of the senior activity center are designed in. So we break out of that interior space and venture into the, house, how, uh, the uh, green spaces uh, 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 outside. In fact, there was a row of car parks that was outside that we managed to convince the authority to transform them into community garden for our seniors and to allow 24-7, 24 hours, seven days a week access to continue for them to use this space while still can access to the interior gym and rehab facilities uh, and to blur the uh, spaces of indoor and outdoor to make it more adaptable and changeable for different type of programs. We see some of the photos. Uh, one of the requests is also to introduce a new drop-off point. You can see that how uh, favorable the drop-off point is to our seniors. And we turn this into a social space that overlooking the community garden that was transformed previously from a car park as well. And you can see how our seniors are enjoying the outdoor spaces while they can also venture into the indoor spaces to use all this facility. Most of them are open during the day and at night, partially it'll be closed. The rest are still open for them to access. Next. Second case is that we developed this program together with uh, uh, Changi General Hospital as part of Sing Health Group uh, to develop this 12 weeks co-design uh, program so as can function as a social prescribing uh, for our seniors. So if they have issues, especially to do with mental well-being, they can be introduced to join this program uh, in the East. So it consists of three weeks, uh, no, sorry, uh, three, almost three months of uh, training in a way. They will be trained in placemaking, co-design. They, they will bring them around uh, Singapore to see how different places are designed. They involve in our workshop. They, they pick up a place in their own neighborhood to design for them. Uh, in this case, uh, one of the first group was pick, uh, has picked a location that's surrounded by both the private estate as well as the public estate. So the demography from different walks of life coming together. And lastly, how do they continue to run this place totally by themselves? So this set apart from other community gardens that you can see across the whole, all Singapore. Next. So this is the process. You can see them coming in, we burning all the recycled pallet wood. You can see the seniors together with our children as well to co-building this place together. So it, instead of just you know, uh, coming out uh, with idea and ask a builder to come and build for them, they are involved in the sowing, the making, the digging of the soil, the mixing of the soil, uh, the fertilizing, building out a structure, and finally maintaining this. And we have our monthly harvest event. It was just happened last Saturday as well. Uh, that we, involve, we, we grow vegetables, not just for the farmers themselves, but for the entire community. So a few hundred people turn out every month to celebrate this harvest event. So this is also one of the first kind in Singapore as well. Next. So you can see how happy our seniors are. They all come from different walks of life. Uh, I was just walking at the corner. I'm just taking photo. Uh, they, are, they, are the, they are the one doing most of the work. <laughs> Next. And we translate this idea, not just in the neighborhood, but in the town. We are invited to put up a pavilion for the uh, recent Singapore Archifest, Architecture Festival. And we recycle this waterproofing cell. Uh, no, sorry, it's a water drainage cell into a pavilion where the citizen can come and do farming of edible plants together. And this happened right outside our, our Urban Redevelopment Authority. 
so we you can see how the public space was transformed with youngsters and seniors all coming together, give talk, and uh, you know turn this public space into a wonderful social space. Next. The third project, we work with a uh, uh, person living in dementia and their caregivers. Uh, so this is the jigsaw puzzle that we developed. We saw them playing games with jigsaw puzzle, and it's very hard to interview them through uh, our traditional way. So we developed this very visual, very easy way to, for them to put together, and then we use that as a, as a way to pick up conversation. We brought them around their neighbor. Some of them never come out of house, even for the past half a year. Uh, so that is very sad when we hear that. we. Uh, we maybe brought in to visit them. There was, that was the first time they actually stepped out of her house in the past six months. And we walk around the places and see where the places they want to go but couldn't reach there because of certain hurdle. So we use that methods to redesign some of this neighborhood. Next. So we developed this uh, framework. I won't go into detail, but some of this uh, has been uh, extensively reviewed. But one of the uh, issues that we face is continuity. We realize that perhaps adaptability may be a better word to not just continue what they used to do because they, can't, they couldn't, but what about adapt to a new way of life? So we, we use that as a way, to, as a stepping stone and milestone to just bring them out of the house, designing de delightful and purposeful places so they even want to come out and to have choice, adaptability, and to have engaging, so that engaging environment and purposeful programs so that they want to carry on. Next. Uh, this is still in the making. We are still in the part of designing together with Yochu Kang, uh, which is one of the uh, first dementia-friendly uh, uh, neighborhood uh, in Singapore. So we are working very closely with the community designing. This is the chess corner that we reframe it from the left original con uh, context. Uh, now we are re re seeing how we can highlight this area as a light, light, uh, lighthouse, as we call it. Next. And also the open spaces, we see how the seniors are using that for exercising. And what about the caregivers? How can they also be participating in these uh, very, very wonderful spaces? So we translate them into these uh, places with swing, with table garden, and so on. So I'll share with you maybe when this is realized in a few months' time. The final project I want to share is uh, exercise. So we also went through a series of uh, engagement uh, in this town called Bunle. Uh, and we went through many uh, rounds of interview and data analysis. We look at where they used to do and all that. And one thing that always come out, why don't you exercise is because I have no time. Either they work very hard or even their time, they just sit along many of the benches or sitting at a bus stop. As I was uh, you know, chatting this morning, many of them like to take bus rather than take the train because they remember the bus road and, uh, and the number. So one, what about instead of asking them to come down to the gym corner or exercise corner to exercise, can we bring exercise to them? Uh, why if you transform this bus stop next into a gym stop? So as they're waiting for bus, they can spend 10 minutes uh, of every time. And if they spend 10, 20 to 30 minutes waiting for bus, that can be changed in, from a waiting time into a productive, active time. Uh, so in, uh, in a week, they can probably achieve more than 150 minutes of active uh, you know, exercise. So with that, uh, we, are, we are actually prototyping this together with the uh, uh, agency from MOH as well as from the uh, 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 Land Transport Authority. This is our vision. Uh, we also came out with uh, gamification apps. They can use that to compete with their neighbor and see who do exercise more. And at the end, we will reward them. Next. Uh, I have a video to show, but I don't have the time. So I just have a QR code here. If you want to uh, watch the video, we put together 10 new future architecture typology that we call design together with Lian Foundation. Uh, we published it in a book called Second Beginnings. Uh, so we put together this video. You can take a look at all the 10 different typology of architecture that we propose for future senior living. Some of them is about community spaces. Some of them is about assisted living spaces, which uh, I also be very honored to be engaged by some of the authority to realize some of them in the next few years. With that, uh, thank you very much. Uh, they come to my last slide. This is the book I mentioned, Second Beginnings. Uh, 
you can download the book, it's free uh, through this QR code as well. I would like to take this opportunity to, to thank my team. Without them, this one, uh, all this project would not happen. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chong. Please take a seat at the armchair. And I really wish we could show the video, but I guess uh, we can share the QR code on our event website after the event. So I see many people showing their smartphones. So please do access our website for the wonderful video. I am sure so. Thank you. And uh, followed by, I would like to go to the next speaker. We have Dr. Katsunori Kondo. Dr. Kondo is Professor of Social Epidemiology and Health Policy at the Center for Preventive Medical Sciences and the Graduate School of Medicine at Chiba University. He has been leading a joint research project with Yamaha Motors in implementing open-air electric carts in the city to assist older persons in their daily lives. Drawing key findings from this project, he will share with us the significance of mobility in improving older people's health. So, uh, Kondo Sensei, please, and he will be making his presentation in Japanese. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, in introduction. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be here and sharing our knowledge and experience with you. Uh, most audience of today is Japanese, and I'm comfortable using Japanese. Uh, and we have a very good uh, translation services, so I will use uh, Japanese from now. えっと、今日私はえ、モビリティ移動とですね、え、そう、社会的包摂、ソーシャルインクルージョン、そして健康についてま、この間取り組んでいること地域に閉じこもりの人が多いか少ないか、ま、そういう地域を特性を診断するところが発端でした。そしたらご覧のようにですね、非常に坂の多い地域でして、え、もう家からですね、お買い物に行こうと思うと、ま、行きが下りだとしたら帰りは上り、ま、逆もあるわけですけども、え、ま、若い頃、この住宅買った頃
というので、地域の老人クラブの会長さんからですね、その地域に声をかけていただいたら、その運転をするぐらいだったら俺にもできるよと。だから手伝ってもいいよっていう人が、あっという間に数十人集まったわけです。で、これ実は今年度もやってるんですけども、ある団地で呼びかけたら、なんとそのドライバーやってもいいよって人が100人手を挙げてくれたというので、ちょっと私たちの想像以上で驚いたという経緯もありました。次お願いします。で、これをですね、そのヒアリングをして、どこにこういうのがあったら行きたいですかと聞いたら、駅、まで20分かかるので、そこまで連れてってくれれば、電車に乗って東京とかあちこちに行ける。だから駅に連れてってほしいっていう声と、もう一つはお買い物をしてですね、例えば白菜2個持って牛乳買ってっていうともう重くって20分歩くのが辛いと。だからスーパーまで連れてってほしい。まあ、そんなあの声を集めてですね、えー、っと、まあ、駅に行く2経路とスーパーに行く経路を作ってですね、走らせたわけです。次お願いします。で、これはあの去年やったデータですけれども、えっと、全部で600人ぐらいの方にご協力いただいてですね、2つの自治体の3つの地区で試験走行をしました。そうしますと利用者は6割が女性で後期高齢者が 65% やはり免許を返納したりして車自分で運転しなくなるとこういう必要性が高まるということですそれで今までの評価っていうのは利用者にだけいかがでしたか事後的な評価だけなんですけども私たちは使ってない人たちにも調査をさせていただいて本当に差があるのかどうか確かめてみようということをやりました次お願いしますそれでこういう効果を検証するときにはロジックモデルって言ったりするんですけども電動カートを導入することで利用する人たちが現れて運転とか運営する人も必要になるその結果、外出とか社会参加する人が増えるだろう。それが個人レベルと地域レベルでいろんな変化をもたらすだろう。個人レベルで行けばですね、えー、まあ歩く量が増えたり、まあ、人とのやりとりが増えて、コミュニケーションが増えて、あるいはそういうので、えー、たまには東京に行くぞっていうんで楽しみが増えたりするんじゃないか。まあ、その結果、身体機能の、えー、身体面、心理面、いろんな面での機能低下が防げるのではないか。あとはコミュニティでは、まあ、運転手のボランティアやる人とかですね、まあ、お互いに顔見知りになったりして人々のつながりが豊かになるんじゃないのかでそれがさらに何ヶ月何年も続いていけば、えー、健康に良い影響を及ぼして、えー、さらにはこの費用も浮くのではないかと、まあ、こんなことを考えたわけですそれで、まあ、この健康にいいよっていうことが分かれば、まあ、それだけでも素晴らしいことですがもう一つ私たちが今期待しているのはこれを導入することで、社会保障給付費が減ったら、その費用を使ってこのカートを導入できないかと。要介護になって、介護に充ててる費用を、介護にならない、必要にならないための予防的な投資にお金を投入する先を切り替えられないだろうかという試みです。で、今1年間に日本で介護保険のサービスを使っている方、平均で200万円使っています。特別養護老人ホームとかデイサービスとかでサービスに使っている人は年間200万円です。で、先ほどの電動カート、約400万前後だそうです。だとしたら、年間に2人、年間じゃなくていいですね、5年間でもいいですね、2人認定受ける人を減らせるのであれば、その400万円でカートを買って、それをみんなで使って、出歩くようにして、認定を受ける人を2人減らせないか。まあ、そんなことを考えて、今、実証実験をやってるわけです。次お願いします。で、これが、その導入前の高齢者に GPS 持っていただいて、動き回ってもらった行動半径です。で、この赤い線がその走ったエリアで、そこで駅まで行って、駅に乗って、電車に乗って、あちこちに出かけている様子があります。で、それが導入前で、これが導入後。で、こちらの広がりのが大きいのがわかりますね。で、これを定量的に調べてみますと、行動半径が 1.5 倍に増えている。やはり行動の変容をもたらしているということが確認できました。次お願いします。でもう一つこういう効果を評価するときによくあるのは導入後に行動半径広がりましたか
、えーまあ、そんなことを聞いておしまいっていう評価が多いんですけれども、えー、私たちはその比較対象群も置いてですね、えー、前後の変化を見てでその結果本当にこの変化が使ってない人たちよりも大きいんだろうか、えー、それを評価してみました。まあ、こういうことをやらないと、例えばコロナがやってきた。で、そのために行動が減ってしまった。しかし、これがあることで実は減り方が少なかったということがあったとしたら、それも効果ではないか。それを見るためには、この二軍間で前後比較する必要がある。ということで、ここの差をですね、この背景要因を揃えた上で、ここに差が生まれるのかというのを調べてみました。その結果が次のスライドです。で私たちが最初考えてたのは、そういうこと、そういうモビリティサービスを入れると、外出とか行動範囲とか歩く時間が増えるのではないかと期待していました。ところが、それよりも大きい効果があったものがあります。それが何かというと、地域活動に参加することが増えたとかですね、いろんな人と話したり、助け合う機会が増えたという人が3割以上いらっしゃいました。だからまさにソーシャルインクルージョンを支援するそんな機能も持っているということが分かったわけですでさらに気持ちが明るくなるとか楽しみが増えたとか声を出して笑う機会が増えたこんなポジティブな心理的な効果までもたらされているということが見えたわけです、えー、単に移動を支援するモビリティ支援にとどまらずソーシャルインクルージョンを進めて心理社会的な効果もあるこれほど差があるのであれば介護保険を利用する人を減らせるポテンシャルがあるかもしれないというところまで2ヶ月間の実証実験でたどり着いたので、今度は走行期間を6ヶ月間に伸ばしてですね、それで介護予防効果まであるのかどうかを現在研修しているところです。次お願いします。でこれをやるためには全国でご協力いただける自治体、あるいはその町内会でそういうドライバーを集めてくれてですね、えー、こういう実証研究に協力してくださるところを増やして、えー、数百人だと5年検証にかかるところを、もし数千人がご協力いただければ、もっと短期間に効果を検証できて、えー、効果があるということが分かれば安心して日本全国にコストを、えー、エフェクティブな方法として社会に実装できるのではないか。まあ、そう思っていましたところ、高齢社会白書にもご紹介いただけたところです。えー、ぜひ今日ご参加されている自治体関係者、あその他あ、まあ、地域の方たちもいらっしゃると思います。ぜひ、この実証研究、来年もフィールドを増やして検証を進めたいと考えております。えー、ぜひご協力いただけたらと思います。どうもありがとうございました。近藤先生ありがとうございます。Thank you, Kondo 先生 for the wonderful presentation. And now that we have heard two presentations from the lens of social architecture and mobility, I believe that actually put us into perspective of the importance of physical environment as enablers to promote healthy longevity. And that actually brings us back to what Professor Wang was speaking about in, in his keynote lecture. So that is the reason why we invite him back to the stage as a discussion to join us for the discussion in panel two. So thank you, Professor Wang. And um, so now, um, may I uh, ask you to like share with us what is share with us more on like what is done in the region actually, like uh, in this area of uh, age friendly cities. Well, uh, th thank you very much, Ms. Abe. But firstly, I'd like to congratulate、uh, Professor Chong and Professor Kondo on two great talks, which show the importance of a whole of society effort.、Uh, we have someone from、uh, an architect from the University of Technology and Design, and we have someone from the Graduate School of Medicine from Chiba University. And you can see that both of their interventions, one in terms of shaping the built environment, and one in terms of promoting last mile and first mile transportation, can have such immense effects and benefits to health. So, if there was one message I wanted to share with everyone in, in this, you know, attending this conference. Is that we need every sector of society working together because this is such a difficult and challenging time.
task that we have ahead of us, but it is solvable. Um, so Ms. Abe asked, asked me to whether I could just share a few things about, again, uh, um, but, uh, you know, what we are doing in Singapore and how Japan has really uh, helped. Uh, next slide. So um, this is a slide from Professor Hiroko Akiyama uh, um, at the uh, University of Tokyo. And she actually inspired certainly myself and many people uh, around the world in what she was doing in Kashiwa City. And so I actually brought uh, a delegation to study what was happening in Kashiwa City on how uh, um, people in Japan were really harnessing a whole of society effort in a township to improve a healthy longevity. Next slide. And recently, um, Singapore has been very fortunate that Professor Emi Kyoto uh, has um, moved to Singapore and joined the National University of Singapore to help us understand and learn how to develop Ibasho. How can we, how can we harness older people as assets in our communities? And so we are doing this uh, in specific areas. And if this works, we're going to ramp this across Singapore. Next slide. So because of this, um, we have attempted a, attempted a very ambitious program where we are taking one whole township, uh, we inspired by Professor Akiyama, uh, uh, the township of Queenstown, a population close to 100,000 people, already 22% are aged over 60, uh, 80, 80 are living in public housing. So this is representative of Singapore in 2030. And working in a whole of society, whole of government effort, we want to increase healthy longevity. We want to enable purposeful longevity. We want to promote intergenerational bonding. We want to support a community for all ages and allow aging in place. Uh, we have two pillars, preventive health and care delivery and purposeful longevity, and four platforms, planning and design of the built environment, use of technology, communications and engagement, and very important, evaluation. We are trying to implement all the nine, eight goals and nine recommendations of the National Academy of Medicine report that I shared earlier. Next. And the way we are doing this, again, the importance of co-design, as Professor Chong mentioned. So not only is it very important for universities, policymakers and governments to share their ideas, but equally important, we have to know from the residents what is important to them and what are their priorities. And these are the five areas that we are seeking to evaluate. Productivity and engagement, well-being, security, cohesion, and equity. Next slide. Um, since Arwin is looking at the importance of technology, I do want to stress the importance of data. So Singapore has two data systems covering all health systems. Two thirds of the island are using a commercial platform known as Epic. One third is using all scripts. These are commercial platforms in which the data is extracted into the national electronic health record. And every citizen has a free app called Health Hub. And this app allows you to monitor your own health and your children's health and other members of the family if they give permission. Next slide. And so finally, Singapore is investing tremendously in 12 areas. You can see the 12 areas. And this is a whole of government activity uh, on, for, for successful aging. But again, this is the challenge faced by the whole world. Asia is aging, one of the, fast, is, is the fastest aging continent in the world. And we look to forum like this and very grateful to Arwin for organizing this. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Wong, for your comments. So um, now I would like to start a, um, firstly, I would like to ask if there's any questions in the chat, question Q&A box, so there isn't any questions. So um, let me maybe toss one question to like the panelists, actually. Um, I found the um, findings from Kondo Sensei's presentation about um, the older males, they were actually like, they wanted to like participate more in the community. They actually volunteered to be like drivers and 
the um, for the electric cards. So um, actually, my question is actually meant for uh, Mr. Chong. But um, so, were there any like um, interesting like gender differences like findings in when you were implementing public spaces design? Sure. Thank you, Ms. Abi. Um, yes, actually, we see a lot uh, in these gender differences as well in the public spaces. Uh, we see a lot of uh, activities being organized by the organization and most of the participants are female, whereas the male you, is actually outside those places and hanging out by themselves. So we do see that kind of divide. But on the other hand, uh, by implementing some of these programs, that understand the needs and also their lifestyle and bringing those programs, not just within the center, but outside the center, you tend to see more male being involved. One of the cases that we, I showed earlier, touch point, uh, when it was built, when it was done, um, we can see that there's a lot more male participants coming in, not just as participants because they are here to teach. They say, yeah, I, I know calligraphy. There's a ready pool of audience uh, of, to, to sign up. I can teach calligraphy, they come and teach. I came to teach painting, I came to teach uh, English, or uh, teach uh, how to use technology. So we see this uh, more male participants actually coming in because of that, uh, both teaching, also learning new technology and so on. So as we do see that if you are able to combine program and place at the same time, you see more balance of that. Thank you. So I guess um, it's the older generations are like, um, they want to get more involved actually, but um, they are looking for sort of like the ways that they can get involved. So I guess, thank you for your answer. Yeah. And to contribute. I think that's a very good example uh, that uh, Prof Kondo mentioned. Uh, they come here to contribute and find meaning in life. I think that's one thing that we can actually draw them. Thank you so much. So it's but um, it's like to have a sense of belonging in the communities as well. So, so um, actually, so my next uh, question is meant for Kondo Sensei, and uh, I would like to um, comment in Japanese. Or so,関して結構健康の方でポジティブな行動が見られたっていうことだったんですけれどもあの高齢者の方の健康のみならずあの、例えばその地域への貢献によって地域にどういうインパクトが見られたかっていうのをちょっと簡単にご紹介いただけますでし
there were um, this word called redesigning health systems, redesigning communities, so um, to make it in the age-friendly ways. So, um, and I also wanted to, actually I want to ask Professor Wong for his last comment about the last mile implementation. You mentioned about the um, first mile and last mile in transportation, but any, do you have any further comments about the last mile implementation? So. Well, my last comment actually is to take a quotation uh, from Manchester, where they have a manifesto called a design for life. And there are four principles. Number one, aging is not a problem. We must not think of older people as a burden, but as citizens. Number two, older people, like all people, are diverse with different needs. Number three, we should not plan for stereotypes, and we should not plan by putting ourselves in other people's shoes. We must plan, as Professor Chong said, with people, not for people. And number four, most importantly, we must design a life that values what makes life good. So if we know what life makes life good, that's how we should design our cities and our life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to the panelists and Professor Wong for joining us as a discussant. And it really um, taught me many lessons, actually, because as one member of the future generations, I think I'm our generation is really like the ones who should be thinking about this seriously. So thank you. And please give a round of, of applause to once again to our speakers. And so with that, I would like to hand over the microphone back to Ms. Kashiwagi. Over to you. Thank you very much, Ms. Abe. And that brings us to the end of the Arwen Forum portion of today's event. Thank you to everyone for your insightful presentations and to our audience for your excellent questions. Let's have another big round of applause for our speakers and moderators. We will now take a short break. The 2022 Happy Awards Ceremony will begin at 10 minutes past four. For those online, please stand by and we will return shortly. Thank you very much. <laughs>